So hello everybody and welcome to our final seminar in the series for 2122. They'll be starting again in September, I think. Um, so I am delighted anyway, but um, this is a nice strong finish to our series uh, to introduce our speaker who is um, Dr. Mushtaba Sultanlu. And Mushtaba originally studied occupational therapy, which I was surprised about, and in Iran and worked as a cognitive therapist with children with developmental and learning disorders for seven years. Um, he then completed a PhD in neuroscience in Germany, and then a two-year postdoc in the same lab, and then a second postdoc in Canada at the University of Western Ontario. Then in September last year, he joined the School of Psychology at the University of Surrey here in the UK as an assistant professor. And there he conducts, as well as teaching, obviously conducts research examining how children acquire knowledge and develop cognitive skills such as mathematics and why some of these children experience difficulties in acquiring those skills. So today he's going to be talking to us about the mathematical brain from birth to school. So I am going to hand over to Mushtaba, but before I do, just to let you know, do um, pop questions in the chat as we go through. Um, we can either answer them as we go or we can answer them at the end. As you know, it's also being recorded. Um, but for now, I will hand over to you, Mushtaba. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for, uh, for the nice introduction and uh, basically inviting me. Uh, for this presentation. I'm so delighted to be here and discussing uh, our ongoing uh, systematic review. Um, I hope you all can see my screen. Yes, and the presentation absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so today we, today we are going to discuss a bit about um, the existing literature, brain imaging literature, um, that investigated uh, mathematical and numerical processing and cognition, basically, in early development, um, that we call it as, as birth time till to the school, before getting into formal schooling. Um, this would be the agenda for today, uh, the outline of uh, my presentation. So we briefly go through the numerical systems and then going through the, the steps of our systematic review, and then looking into the infant studies, the tasks that they use, the findings, and then we switch to um, older kids, well, here older means um, preschool uh, children, and then we try to put the findings together to see whether we can um, conclude something out of those existing literature. Let's just start with a uh, numerical system. Um, on a very, very general and broad uh, definition, we will have, or we have as human, um, two numerical systems. One is uh, non-symbolic, which, uh, which is a kind of older system that our ancestors uh, used to use that system as well. Um, and at some certain point, we as human um, decided or tried to develop some symbols for each of those quantities. So for example, here in the uh, picture uh, on the screen, as you see on the left side, those non-symbolic could be whatever, any image. So a group of people, a group of animals, a group of trees or flowers or any, any sort of object which has a kind of identity, but that identity has not a kind of symbol, quantity symbol for that. And then for each of those quantities, for example, here, let me just turn on the laser point that might help. For each of those quantities, for example, here is two things, could be whatever. Here they are dots, but they could be any, any sort of object. We created this symbol. And this symbol, of course, in different cultures, um, they are differently. So for example, in Chinese, two is written in a different way, or this is like Arabic symbol that, that is uh, mostly used in Western um, cultures or Western countries, but we have Eastern Arabic or Indian, for example, the symbols that we use in 
um, in um, Iran or in Arabic countries as well. So those symbols have been created to represent those quantities. So um, let's have a closer look at those systems. Um, the num non symbolic system uh, or number system is, is a kind of ancient or very old system, which we share with other non-human animals. Um, for example, monkeys, um, dogs, or some any several other species, uh, and human as well. Because of that, uh, it's believed that even infants, um, so we have they have this this kind of system. We are born with this system, uh, um, actually, and and then later uh, that system helps us to create or is a kind of foundation for more advanced system that we get into later. And this system by itself, this non-symbolic system has two subsystems. One is called um, object tracking system or OTS. It's kind of very exact system, uh, but it's very limited to one, two, three, and four maximum about, which is called subitizing range as well. Um, this is something that um, we can, for example, when, just a, as an example, when we enter a room, when there are like one, two, three, or up to four people, um, on the first glance, we can get a get an exact estimation of the number of people in the room. If there are like three, if I have just a glass, I will, if you ask me how many people you just saw in the room, I most probably I can't tell you the exact number of people there. But the other system, which is approximate number system uh, is related to larger numbers. So from the name, you can um, imagine that it's not exact anymore. Uh, it's more approximate. Just coming back to our example, when there are like 10 people in a room, when I have just a glass and you ask me how many people are there, I can give you a rough estimation, which is, which might be depend on that system, how precise is, based on the individual differences. Um, but I wouldn't, I might, may tell you eight, nine, 10, 11, or something around 10. Um, but most probably I wouldn't say like 20 or 30. So um, it's a kind that follows like two rules. I, I don't wanna go so much into details of those scalars that if the number increases, so for example, um, giving an estimation or approximation of 10, 20, 12, or 13, which is like a rather small number, is more precise than larger numbers. If if there are like in a, in a big hall, there are like 80 people, the probability of giving a, um, a clear or more precise estimation is, uh, is more difficult. Uh, so probably I would say maybe 60, which has like 20 uh, different, and it follows a kind of ratio as well. Um, which is, for example, when, when we compare two sets, um, we follow a kind of ratio. So if they are very close to each other, that's very difficult. For example, if I flash here seven versus eight people, it's very difficult to say where we see more, for example, people, more people. Um, but if it's, I flash here on the screen seven versus 14, it's pretty simple because the ratio in the first example is seven over eight, which is very, very tiny um, and very, very difficult. But the second one is seven over 14, which is one over two, which is very simple even for infants to recognize. And the second system, um, which is a later system, uh, which is developed basically in the development trajectory, it's developed later and Later, we come back to that, how it's associated with the, um, with the non-symbolic is, uh, is a symbolic number system um, or numerical symbol knowledge. Uh, this is a kind of milestone in, in during the development. And it, this system is associated with informal knowledge that we, that we acquire, for example, um, the counting list, so, uh, which, is, which has been memorized. So when a kid, even at the age of, um, two, two and a half, the parents or other adults, they keep repeating numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on. They just memorize it without necessarily understanding the meaning of those 
uh, numbers or the list that they start counting. Uh, th this is <clears throat> later, this will be associated with that symbolic knowledge that we develop later on. And also, when we when a kid grows up, uh, when they go to the, to the school, they start formal mathematical knowledge, they, they start acquiring that formal knowledge. Um, this system is also um, associated strongly with, with that formal. This is actually going is literature has been shown that this symbolic knowledge is the um, the strongest predictor of formal mathematical learning at school. So um, this is a kind of, if you wish to say, mediating uh, knowledge that we acquire. And it has different steps or different categories or subsystems by itself. The first is identification, that we can identify the symbol. When, for example, when I see the symbol of two, I can understand that this means uh, two. If you ask me what's that symbol, I can distinguish it from symbol seven. Okay, and the next step is cardinality. This is maybe the most important step or subsystem of uh, um, symbolic knowledge that we acquire, uh, which means that I can associate after identification of those symbols, I can associate them with the magnitude related to that. For example, when you ask me um, three, or when you tell me three, number three, I can associate it with three things, whatever they, they are, right? Um, and, and vice versa, when I see like four things, I can associate it with the symbol of four, the way that's written or we created. And I have, I, I used to see it on the, for example, on, on the written form or um, auditory format. Um, and the next step is ordinality. Ordinality is, to understand the order, what comes after uh, one specific number or quantity, which means that quantity is larger, or what comes before, which means that quantity is smaller than the original, and so on. For example, two comes before three, and um, four comes after three. So uh, understanding those concepts to associate it on the, uh, for example, number line that we have. This system um, starts to be developed around the age of two to four years old. There's a huge um, variance based on many different factors, but this is the, the starting um, age that we, we turn to be one knower, which means I understand what is one. And then after um, a few months, I understand two and three and so on. So it follows a kind of one-to-one -one corresponding principle, it's called. Uh, which means, as I said, in my counting list, I may be able to count from one to even 100, but doesn't mean necessarily I understand the meaning of what I'm counting, okay, till that stage. In that stage that I am developing this cardinal principle knowledge um, or cardinality, I start from my list and like top of my list, associate one with the magnitude or quantity of one, and then two with two things and, and, and so on. And at some certain point, which is around number five, which has been debated recently, um, I start generalizing. I'm like, okay, if one is means one thing, two means two things, three is so four. And if five means five things, I start generalizing my knowledge saying that then maybe six means six things seven means seven things and so on. So I start generalizing my knowledge to, the, to my entire um, verbal counting list. And um, it started being associated with non-symbolic so, uh, system. So symbolic and non-symbolic system uh, start communicating with each other, which is called bidirectional mapping hypothesis. Um, so, for example, we start associating symbols to non-symbols or to quantities, which, for example, one of the um, well-known tasks to test it is give a number task. When we ask the kid, give me one, please give me three, give me five, and so on. Or the other way around, a mapping non-symbolic quantities to symbols. When we ask them to estimate, when, for example, we just present for a very short time, um, I don't know, um, seven 
um, objects on the screen and ask them how many you saw. Um, they start, you know, using their approximation system. Okay, um, let's move to the to the next step, which is uh, the systematic review that uh, would be the, the core of this uh, presentation today. Um, in this systematic review, we started our um, search um, very strategically. So we try to be um, very inclusive as regards the definition of the task, because there's a huge variance within literature um, related to you know those terminology that people use. Um, so we try to do our search based on all these uh, terms. So. Um, but you could imagine the combination was around, if I'm not wrong, 800 something search that we did. And basically, uh, most of this search has been done by our um, brilliant um, undergraduate student, um, Vivek. Um, we use all these terms, number processing, number cognition, numeracy, arithmetic, and, and all those that you see here. And um, we combine it with imaging methods. We try to use all these because not everyone, for example, if they use any of those methods in the keywords, they just may have written only neuroimaging or neurophysiology without necessarily naming all those methods. So um, we use those broad terms and also those specific terms um, as regards the method and also because of we want we were interested in that um, time window of uh, zero to around six years old, which differs between countries, but between like six to seven, some countries start a bit later for more schooling. Uh, so we tried again all these combinations of the um, of the age that uh, people use as as the um, keyboards. Um, so we did the search um, within those um, search engines. Um, we used all of them, and also we went through the cited papers. So what, when if we found one relevant paper, we went to look into the cited ones, uh, what, the papers that cited them, and then we used um, an online platform, which is um, which is commercial, unfortunately, uh, which is called Covidence but uh, was very helpful in our case. Um, in the first step, after um, identifying around 9,400 literature, um, so we excluded the duplicated ones because you, you could imagine that um, we ended up with having similar findings in different search engines. So around half of them were excluded. And then we started screening. And this step was done by uh, two people to ensure that we don't miss anything. Um, most of them were excluded because based on the, uh, the screening of the title and the abstract. And um, we ended up with 159 studies. And then this step was again done by two, sometimes three people because I, I went in whenever it was needed. Um, and then again, based on um, all these criteria that we have written here, um, we excluded quite a few of them. And then we finally ended up with 33 studies. Um, worth mentioning that this literature review has been done a year ago. So um, we tried to do another quick literature search later on to check the, in the last um, couple of months if there has been any study that we didn't include here. Okay, as regards the, uh, the, the year of the publication, the very first study, which was kind of um, um, life lasting, let's say, um, um, lifespan study, I would say, starting from like preschool age till 80 something, um, was published in 1964. Um, and then there was no study for, for about 30, 34 years. And then gradually the study came out and this was the year that we had most of the, the studies in, in a field. Um, but in, in, as you see, 
well, altogether we had 33 studies, not, not many um, actually. And um, separating based on the age, it's quite interesting to see that 11 of those, uh, they tackled infancy or pre infants below the age of one. And this is the, like, this is called the black box of human cognition, toddlerhood. Um, there is absolutely no study in that age that investigated numerical processing, which is quite surprising and sad, of course. Um, and then it, we, it goes to uh, preschool age, three to six years old about, uh, which we had, uh, where we had like 22 studies. As regards the methods, um, you see, we, we try to, to separate them. Um, six of them were structural MRI or DTI that mostly looked at the brain behavioral correlation. So outside of the scanner, they conducted math test or numerical test. And then within the scanner, they recorded the, um, the structural MRI, and then they tried to find the association between the behavioral performance in the math and the brain structures. Most of them are like that. Um, and we had 12 fMRI studies, 16 EG or basically ERP, because with EG, as you know, we can do different analysis, but most of them were ERP studies. A few of them look into um, time frequency domains, but um, heavily ERP studies and two near the studies we had as well. Okay, let's um, jump into the infant studies. Um, before looking at the, at the result, um, I think it's, it might be interesting to look at some of the tasks that have been used because um, that might be interesting for some people uh, if they are not familiar with the field that which kind of task could be used in those uh, um, very young kids. Um, people have been using different tasks like visual adaptation, uh, passive viewing of numbers, not number, but non-symbolic. All of those tasks are like non-symbolic tasks uh, because apparently we, we cannot use symbolic tasks because there is no symbol or no symbol has been developed uh, in the first year of the life uh, regarding numbers, I mean. And um, auditory adaptation, uh, number alteration, and um, arithmetic operation, addition and subtraction tasks uh, in, in those young kids. Let's have a closer look at some, some of the examples. Um, here is one of them, uh, which is um, called habituation and adaptation. So there's a kind of familiarization phase that we, we try, or researcher, they try to familiarize the, the infants with a set of numbers. As you see, for example, here, there are like eight numbers or eight dots, eight things, eight objects. Um, and they manipulated some visual characteristics of that, but they kept they kept it um, constant, um, actually, <clears throat> as regards the numerical domain. Um, so it, it's like eight, 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 and so on. So this is the familiarization phase or habituation phase. And in testing phase, they started um, changing or manipulating the numbers uh, or the number of dots or objects, okay? So basically, um, they, they kept using those eight dots, but there, there's a kind of novel or violation of numbers, okay? So they, they kept showing them eight, 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 and then they change it to 16, and then eight, 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 16, and so on. This is a kind of similar task used in another study. So as you see, this is like habituation of four objects, uh, which could be deviated or deviant. These are like all deviant that, that violate that rule. It's like four, four, four things. As you see, the arrangement changes, but the number could be changed or color could be changed. And then people um, or the researcher um, they look into the reaction of the cats or basically brain response to that. They're like mostly passive tests because we cannot expect active reaction of those kids. Or in, in some other tasks, which are like number alteration, it's like um, very quickly they show number of sets of dots 
and then again um, they violate. So one 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 violating to two, as you see here, it's like one one one. There's no violation. One changes to two, and one changes to three, and this is like for large number as well. Same here in other studies, they kept changing. So this is like number alteration. So I keep seeing a set of dots or a number, uh, if you can call it, like it's like six things, six things, and, and it's repeated, and then it changes to, for example, um, 12 things and so on. Um, and then it's a kind of um, violation of expectation, right? Because my brain is start being adapted to um, six things, but there's kind of violation. That violation could be color. It's like, oh, yellow changed to red. Well, I don't know the name of that color um, as an infant, for example, but I could realize that the changes, which is many changes in my attention system. Um, and this is also interesting to see um, how they did arithmetic operation. Um, Basically, this is again um, based on violation of expectation. It's, they they showed like two puppets, and they hide them. They took one out, and then they showed the result. So if it was like two, they took one. Everything happened like in front of the kid. Um, if the result is one, everyone is happy. Kid is not shocked. But this is like the true test. But that might be shocking as well. So there is one puppet there. They hide it in front of the kid. They add one another puppet. It seems that the, the infants, they expect to see two things. But when they um, take the curtain away, they see still one. And um, they, they show kind of surprise that, oh, this is not what I, what I expected. So... Um, we have correct and incorrect trials and so on. So they manipulate um, different things here, but this is essentially, they, and they don't of course go beyond two. So it's like either two minus one or one plus one um, and not, not other uh, magnitudes. Let's have a quick look at the, at the findings. What did they, they observe? Um, in one of the nearest studies, uh, Daniel Hyde, they, they could record or they could observe the response to number changes uh, in the right parietal cortex. And um, when they change the shape of the stimuli, um, th that changes or that brain responses happen in the right occipital cortex. And interestingly, it led to kind of significant interaction. So basically uh, to the, our attentional system um, was active or when the dimension, the non-numerical dimension was manipulated, occipital uh, region responded, but when numerical dimension was manipulated, it was the parietal cortex and right parietal cortex, which was uh, active and reacted to that. Um, in another study, they, they observed a very similar thing when they started manipulating the, um, the numbers, um, on the right parietal cortex in this region, they could observe the response to number changes. And um, what they had as a kind of control, it was audiovisual animation, which needed so much at, um, attention. And interestingly, during that time, which was um, heavily demanded on the, on the attentional system, they could observe on like um, an occipital, but more in, into the middle midline. Um, on the middle occipital area, they observed that manipulation of attention. So basically, as we see, there's kind of distinction between so between the response, brain response to number change and brain response to um, attentional change. Um, in in another study, the uh, the researcher they used this. Uh, um, violation of expectation, as I explained now, um, about addition and subtraction, and um, they could detect the right parietal um, activation, as they could see in adults, um, almost the same area was detected to be responding to the um, to the changes in the numerosity of the of the stimuli. 
Um, however, looking into the uh, into the um, that error detection, basically, if we can call it that, whether it was like correct response or non-correct response, this was this is more a, a domain general or cognitive process, not necessarily numerical activation. But again, interestingly, uh, that activation was very similar in infants um, as regard the area, which was like front to central area, and the timing was was very similar between infants and adults. So it seems a kind of shared non-symbolic processing of the um, of numbers uh, is happening in infancy and adulthood. Another study they could replicate it later, a couple of years uh, later in, um, in a group of kids, again, front to central and all those changes. So I'm not going to explain details again. So that was basically the, the main findings in, in infancies, that right parietal cortex seems to be um, reactive to numerosity changes. Um, so based on the literature later, we will discuss that. That might be the area um, that we suppose that we are born with, which this um, non-symbolic, magnitude processing it has been implemented there. Let's have a quick look at the um, preschoolers studies. So as you may imagine, um, number of tasks, so we have more freedom, of course, in this case, right? So the variety of the task is much higher in those cases. So I'm not going to read all those through, but um, let's have a quick look at some of them. Um, this is again, the adaptation paradigm showing like 16, 16, 16, and the violating with 32 dots. This is non-symbolic that um, has been tested. Um, similarly, they, they manipulate the deviant or violation could be whatever. One dimension is number, but we can manipulate other dimensions as well, right? To ensure that any, any brain response that we get is number specific and it's not just a domain general attentional manipulation or any reaction to other other uh, characteristics of the um, of the visual uh, visually presented uh, stimuli okay so if it if it's not related or if it's not specific to number changes then we, we might expect to see similar changes or similar brain responses in uh, in response to number change similar to color or areas and so on. In some other tasks, they use um, symbols like letter and numbers versus objects. They are like objects versus subjects uh, or subjective um, um, concepts. Or in, in other tasks, they use matching to, to check whether they could associate these two faces or these two numbers or these two shapes when the size differs a bit and and the uh, written words. Or in another example, they used um, um, audiovisual um, congruent or incongruent. So in congruent uh, trials, they see two objects and they hear two. It's like, I see two, two, they are matched, but I see six, for example, objects, but I hear three. It's like they are incongruent because they don't match with, you, with each other. Um, this is the same um, paradigm in another study that uh, Stephanie uh, recently published. Um, in congruent, again, like I see two, I hear two, but I see, for example, four, but I hear two. So, um, and um, researchers, they look into the brain responses in those conditions versus those conditions. Or in some other examples, um, they ask the, the kids to compare the set of dots um, with a reference number. For example, the reference was five. So they they asked whether this number, this symbol is smaller or larger, um, or this set of dots, whether they are um, larger or smaller than, than five. And the same strategy happens here when we ask to compare uh, two numbers without reference. It's like, which one is larger? 
which one is larger again? Or if it's non-symbolic again, where you see more dots, for example. Um, that happens auditorily as well. And um, um, some based on some uh, Piaget's concept of preservation, whether they, they could understand that, uh, for example, um, if the length changes, but not the numbers, whether they are still the same or not, whether they develop that concept or not, this has been tested in, um, in, in a fMRI scanner. Um, and again, here with, with a huge sequence of very, very fast presentation of that. And this is more natural presentation that I like so much um, that in Jessica Cantlin's um, lab, they use this paradigm um, um, a couple of times. Uh, they publish a few papers on that, which is interesting when, when they present some, some uh, scenes, they have uh, numbers, manipulation of numbers. Um, they they compared that brain, brain response to that specific timing of that, uh, let's say, animation compared to, to the other rest of the, the time, which there was no manipulation of numbers or magnitudes. Okay, let's let's have a look at the at some some of the results. <clears throat> Um, in one of the studies, um, Council and, and, and colleagues, they, uh, what they observed was that in adults group, um, bilateral parietal cortex uh, and specifically intraparietal circus um, responded to numbers. But this response was right lateralized in kids. So basically in kids, it was right IPS or parietal cortex, which responded to, to numbers. There was not that much um, activation on the left side. Um, in another study, um, they investigated three groups of neurons, like they split the group to one to two neurons, three to five, and CP neurons. Those are the kids who develop already, already the cardinality. And what they observed was that this knowledge of symbolic, this symbolic knowledge leads to early negativity in the in an um, ERP study um, in the in the um, parietal occipital area. And when they investigated bilateral parietal area, which is which we are mostly interested in, um, they observed late positivity. So it seems that um, when so this group of kids, one to two nerves, they they haven't there in the very early stage of developing this cardinality or symbolic knowledge. Um, but when, when that knowledge develops, we see that brain responses differently to congruent and incongruent. When they, they see and hear two different things, um, they are shocked. But when they are not, they haven't developed this concept, like in this group, brain is not surprised, let's say, okay? And interestingly, that was ratio dependent. This is what we discussed. So if the ratio is simple, let's say comparing one to six, or let's say in this task, when, I, when I'm when i shown one thing and I'm told six, it's like, oh, this ratio, I could simply distinguish. And um, again, as we see, this ratio has not been developed in those kids, but when they when they develop more and more this concept of symbolic knowledge, um, the brain starts reacting to that on bilateral parietal cortex. This has been shown in other studies as well. And uh, in another study, uh, which used the same paradigm, they, um, they observed that only adults, but not kids, they responded to this um, incongruency. When they hear something and then they see something, so only adults in um, anterior cingulate cortex and a left parietal cortex, they, they react to that incongruency, but not, but not uh, kids. But when they had a closer look at, at the kids, uh, because they had a large sample of kids of 80 in a rather broad age range of 4 to 10, um, they could distinguish between those kids who have already started formal schooling versus those haven't started. And it seems that 
going to school or being exposed to formal mathematics leads or is associated to um, higher and higher, um, let's say, left intraparietal circus activation. This is the area that we think that might be related to symbolic processing. And if we want to uh, put the things together, so it has been already in many studies have shown that numbers as a kind of magnitude is related to bilateral parietal cortex. But how does that relate? So um, in, in a study, they showed that, in, this is an adult study, that non-symbolic, as we already discussed in infants, for example, are, are related even in adulthood they relate, they are related to the right parietal cortex. But when we test them with symbolic uh, material, or symbolic numbers, um, we see um, activation in other hemisphere, which is the left parietal cortex. However, in, in, in a, in a uh, meta-analysis of 57 fMRI studies in adults, um, they could observe that there is a huge overlap between non-symbolic and symbolic areas in the brain. So bilaterally, they show um, um, activations that might be related to, uh, let's say, low power studies that they couldn't detect bilaterally. But when we put them together in a metanosis, we could see that maybe bilateral parietal cortex react to the, to the numbers in either format, symbolic or non-symbolic. Um, this has been suggested that IPS is somehow maybe the origin of non-symbolic processing, which is a foundation for later symbolic number processing, which is developed based on that. Um, but how does that develop? And um, the idea is that we are going to test soon as well, is that on the right parietal cortex, we could, or literature have been frequently shown that right parietal cortex is related to magnetic processing. And at the same time, we know from um, studies in language that um, the left frontal temporal area is, uh, is related to um, language processing, which is mostly about symbols. So economically for the brain makes so much sense to develop or to find some area um, to develop the concept which needs the, the combination of these two uh, processes. So maybe the, one of the best candidates could be the left parietal cortex because it's somehow in the middle and has very good connection to the left temporal area. So could borrow enough simply with, with not so much effort and cost uh, from symbols that have, have been developed before numbers. And at the same time, this could be associated simply to the, um, to the right parietal cortex. So the magnitude and the symbols could come together at some point, which we think is around the age of three, um, three to four something, the, the time that we develop cardinal um, knowledge in the left uh, intraparietal cortex on, on the, the left parietal cortex, basically, because that economically, that makes so much sense. This is the area that has been frequently shown to be related to arithmetic, for example, in older kids or in adults. Putting them together seems that non-symbolic processing is a kind of foundation that we are born with. And later, after a few years, we start developing these symbols or symbolic system based on that non-symbolic ancient system. And then this would be a very good foundation as literature have been shown for, um, for our future formal school math um, that we are, we are exposed to. And also um, there is another uh, theoretical model that has been discussed in, in many papers uh, that it seems that um, the right IPS is constantly there from like from birth to adulthood. And it, we don't expect that much changes in their reaction to numbers. But um, the most of the changes we expect in the left IPS, because at the beginning, 
there's not that much as we discussed infant studies there's not that much um, reaction on the left parietal cortex because this this network which comes and which is like an end product somehow of the um, collaboration between magnetic system and the linguistic system um, has not been developed at the beginning but then later it develops around the age of three and then it um, overcomes the right to be more and more involved in formal mathematical thinking because our thinking changed to be um, to be more symbolic than non-symbolic. Um, however, some there are some issues um, in the literature. So first of all, we don't really have enough studies to to make a very strong conclusion out, out of that. Um, some of the problems are like methodological. It's very difficult to conduct large scale studies, though we had a few um, studies with decent samples, but still power is a big issue in those studies. And we have a huge age gap. So absolutely no studies in toddlerhood and absolutely no longitudinal studies. We have some cross-sectional studies because they had kind of wider age range however um not not let's say enough as regard to power not enough kids per age group if if the age uh, gaps or age groups are very tiny so and also most of the literature are coming from from western um, cultures that would be interesting to see because there are many factors like home numeracy parents education and socioeconomic status and so on might influence um, that development. With that, I would like to close this presentation. And I would like to thank you for your attention and um, mentioning my two collaborators in this study, um, Vivek, um, who did a brilliant job uh, here, and um, Daniel, I'm sorry, was always there for um, helping and for uh, developing the theoretical frame of this study. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a really, really interesting talk. And we've already got some questions coming in the chat. So if you're happy for me to do so, I'll, I'll uh, call those out for you yes. to address. Great. So there's a, there's a comment from Elizabeth um, saying that she continues to wonder about the symbolic representation of what is a mental number line. Now, I don't know whether there was anything you wanted to add to that, Elizabeth, or you're just wanting much about to... to comment on it well mental number line this is like this is a um, hypothetical model um saying that especially in western culture we develop numbers from left to right it, it's a kind of um ruler if you uh, if you wish you know in the brain that has like number zero till unlimited you know it goes to infinity um but it's sorted from left to right um so, and, and then that has been associated with, um, you know, um, special orientation of people. And there are a couple of studies on, on that as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so both Elizabeth and I were very surprised that you found nothing in toddlerhood, which given your findings is a bit annoying, isn't it? Because then that's yeah. where the transition point is. Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no, unfortunately, there is, there is no. We were also very surprised that, um, because I could imagine that, you know, testing, maybe testing toddlers is, is might be a bit easier than infants, uh, right? But we had like 11, 12 studies in infancy, but nothing in toddlerhood. Yeah. Very surprising. Um, so I'm just going to uh, go to a comment by Nathaniel. Um, oh, actually, I thought this was really interesting. So he's saying, I thought infants as young as six months old hadn't yet developed the concept of object permanence necessary to detect errors in the addition subtraction task. He said, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, great presentation. So do you have any comment on that? Uh, in, in, in infancy, you mean? Okay. Yeah, infants as young as six months old not having object permanence. Um, right. Well, um, they, they, they did um, indeed. Actually, well, they this being surprised is based on that cognitive processes, right? So um, when it's hired, so they it seems that they could keep it in in a somehow working memory, if you wish to call. Um, you know that okay, there was an object, then they could keep it. 
uh, and they got surprised when they didn't ex didn't didn't see the object there anymore, or when there was one thing being added again. It heavily contracts with the attentional and memory system as well. But yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, it's the it's more about the change detection expectation, isn't it? I suppose than the yeah. Right, but well, here they use the. the I, I agree with this point that it's a little bit difficult to say whether it's necessarily numbers, right? Um, but however, the manipulation is is a number, is a magnitude, uh, is number of things. But right, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, as Elizabeth agreeing with your economy of the brain, I like that too, and the need for non weird studies. Now, now there's a, um, a question from James saying, do, do you have any thoughts of the role of the lateral frontal cortex in the development of numerical processing? I think that studies in school age children and adults have argued for a transition, yes, right. uh, front, uh, frontal to parietal, perhaps reflecting less cognitive control. Yeah. Do you think that something similar is happening in infancy to preschool or is there a nonlinear, perhaps you shaped relationship? That's, that's a very good question. Um, well, as far as I know, there is no studies in, in infancy that investigated prefrontal cortex. Um, well, we have Izard study that was an ERP study that they say um, number processing is related to right uh, frontal parietal um, processing. Um, which we somehow reduce to right parietal cortex. Um, but specific investigation of the role of prefrontal in infancy, toddlerhood, and um, as far as I know, it hasn't been investigated. But right, about the shift, yes, we have, we have literature like Rivera and um, Stefan Fogel and some others, they, they, have, they have shown that in school-age children, yes, we have economically, again, we have a kind of shift from frontal to parietal because um, automatization happens. So at the first, when I start learning addition, when I add two plus three, I, it's a fourth for me, and I heavily rely on um, prefrontal cognitive processes and executive functions. But gradually, when I get more automatized, right? So there's a kind of shift because that, again, we need to save energy. The brain should be like um, efficient in that regard. So we, sh we we see this shift from frontal to parietal cortex. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, does anybody else have any questions for Mushtaba? We've got about five or six minutes left. If anybody has got anything. Oh, there is uh, some more here. So this uh, question from Dave: Is there any information on what stimulus? is being developed by the child's environment before testing. My understanding is that all learning will have required effort. Um, well, um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether I could understand the question. Um, information on what, did you want to jump in Dave at all and ask your question? Um, uh, sorry, if that's okay. Yes, yes, please yeah, do. I I apologize. Yeah, thank you very much. For, it's a fantastic um, presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I suppose my question is, is that if nothing had happened to the child from the time they were born, would that development uh, have occurred? Or is, is it a consequence? That these abilities that you're showing, are they a consequence of what's happened pre, pre the test phase? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, well, we, we could imagine that from, from, the, from the first hours of the life, right, we are exposed to huge amount of stimuli. And all those stimuli might affect on our cognitive processes. Um, that's a true argument. Um, but some of those studies are on very early um, ages of like 90 days of, you know, 92 the, the, the mean age of this sample was like three months, still not a not few days. If I'm not wrong, there are some studies of a few days, but I don't recall exactly which one is, it was. But I agree that they are influenced in the end. So it's very difficult to say that it's 100% biological 
right? Um, as as long as we are, we are exposed to the environment, even for a couple of hours or a couple of days, well, we are influenced by, by the environment. But however, um, we might say that even there is a confound of environment there, we cannot, we cannot ignore the biological substrate of that processing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for jumping in, Dave. Um, so there's a, another comment in the chat, uh, again, about the biological knowledge that does not need to be taught. And, and just a reference to Sweller. I mean, there isn't specifically a question here. I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Do you know the work of Sweller? Um, no, no, me neither. Should, is it a question to me or? I think it's just a comment about some right. work by Sweller talking about the primary biological knowledge that doesn't need to be taught but I, I it's there's not really specifically a question all right yeah well that's that's a good point um well there was biological knowledge but um i personally when, when i'm thinking of symbolic knowledge not not non-symbolic knowledge but no, symbolic knowledge is is apparently it is kind of biological development but it's definitely influenced by the culture, by the environment as well. Um, but about non-symbolic, um, difficult to, to ignore, specifically if we go, if we go with um, older kids, um, older here, I mean like eight, nine, or a bit, um, 10, 10 months, um, because they are exposed to objects of the environment, from environment. Um, it's difficult to say that it's not influenced, but I agree with this sense of those biological developments uh, are there. But I think we, we need a kind of, um, that potential is there, but we need a kind of environment probably to show that development, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, they just corrected themselves actually and said it was Geary's work, which that I am familiar with. So then Yeah, I'm familiar with, with David yeah. Geary. Work, yeah. Um, does any we've, we've got a couple, we've got one minute left. So has anybody got any questions for Mashkaba before we wrap up for the for the whole year? If nobody does, I'm just gonna ask whether you are looking to fill that gap in the research with toddlers um, to see whether we can find the missing link. Um, well. Not in the near future, but we are starting a longitudinal study in preschoolers from age three on, because this is one of the big gaps. There's no longitudinal study. So we are starting in September a longitudinal study on that. Um, but it's, it's a long-term plan, yes. If you ask me about like master plan, yes. Infancy and, and toddlerhood, um, we are planning to tackle that. Great, okay, well, I'll look out for that. Uh, so that just leaves me to, to wrap up and say thank you so much. It was a really, really interesting talk. And as you can see from the questions, um, other people thought so also. So the recording will be uploaded, um, not immediately, but it will be available on the, our YouTube channel. Um, so thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you once again for a wonderful talk. And we will see you all in September. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Have a good Thank one. You. Bye. Very much. Bye, everyone.